how to creatively stay originated, no, how to creatively stay relaxed in this frenetic, dependently originated world with the help of your friends. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I'll do my best. <laughs> I'll start with creation because that's where everything starts with, doesn't it? Creation. Something isn't and then it is. It's not and then it comes to be. And this is one of the uh, great mysteries of life. That was a, that was a, it was a, a quote from our ex-premier, Bob Carr. I don't know if you ever remember that. There was a time a few years ago when, when there was a... Um, a bit of a problem up in Newcastle. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but there was there was a problem with frozen chickens falling onto the roofs of people's houses. Anyone remember that? How quickly everyone's memory goes. With these, these, these things they stick in my mind and they never leave. <laughs> and and uh, he was questioned about it, and he made the 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 uh, uh, the um, timeless comment frozen chickens falling out of the sky and damaging people's houses. It's one of the mysteries of existence. <laughs> so it's very true, I have to admit, it's very true. And uh, <laughs> creation is also a mystery of existence, how something is not and then comes to be. And uh, different religions, of course, tussle with this in different ways. And uh, <coughs> there's really two solutions to that, or two types of solutions. One solution is to say that um, things change and develop. So uh, you start out with um, something and then you develop other things from that. The other kind of solution is to say that things start from nothing and then come into being. Yeah, so they're called creation ex nihilo, being the, the, the philosophical term creation out of nothing. And, uh, of course, both of them are, are, are difficult to get your mind around because, of course, if you think of creation as being something that starts from something, then, of course, then you want to ask, well, what did that something start from? Yeah? And so then you, you, you have an infinite regress. On the other hand, if you want to think of creation as starting from nothing, then the mind starts to go all funny when you start to figure out how was there nothing and what was going on. And... Uh, Martin Luther was asked that once. What, what was God doing before he created the world? And uh, his answer was he was sitting in a birch forest making rods with which to hit people who ask impertinent questions. <laughs> which is probably as good an answer as any. So... Uh, creation... Uh, the, the, the Buddha's approach to that, I mean, without going too far into that particular question, but the Buddha's approach was uh, simply that it's unknowable. Okay? So the first beginning of things is unknowable. So rather than saying that there was a first beginning or there was not a first beginning, uh, he adopted a, a, a position of agnosticism on that particular point. Okay? So it's, this is worth remembering. You know, the Buddha... Um, sometimes is said to have avoided taking a definite position on philosophical questions and that's that's only true of certain kinds of questions okay so this one particular kind of question he said it's not possible to ever know so it's not he's not making a point about the origination or otherwise of the world he's making a point about the limits of knowledge so the beginning that's creation and then creativity so when we create things right so let's say we're an artist in a sense, we're imitating that act of creation. So whatever, um, you know, we're faced with a blank canvas, right? And that's very intimidating, right? I'm, I'm not, I've never done visual arts, but as a, as a musician, for example, you know, if you sit down and you, you know, you've got a guitar and you want to write a song, you've kind of got an infinite potential, and then that's, that's extremely intimidating, yeah? Where do you start from? You can do anything, and so what that usually means is you can do nothing. 
and so you have to build in more constraints, and so you build in constraints that can actually enable that process to happen. And that was described very well in uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, when as an English uh, uh, lecturer, he asked his student to do a, an essay about the town hall. So they went away and they looked at the town hall, studied it and watched it and so on. They came back the next day and said, I, I can't think of anything to write. He said, well, okay, do an essay about the front wall of the town hall. They said, well, I can't think of anything to write about the whole town hall. So how can I write something about the front wall? He said, just go and do it. They went away, came back the next day. Look, nothing, I can't think of anything to write. He said, go and write me an essay about one brick in the front wall of the town hall. <laughs> and he said, what? That's ridiculous. He said, just do it. So they went and they did it and they wrote, wrote a really interesting essay. Yeah? Because once you've, you've got that, then you can open up your mind because you have to look at, start looking at things in different ways. You're not constrained by previous knowledge and so your, your creativity can, can, be, um, uh, can start to flourish. So that's very, very important to bear that in mind and very important to bear in mind the role of creativity in Dhamma practice. And it's, I think it's something which is absolutely essential. The reality is that, um, that you can't practice Dhamma according to a formula. You can't base yourself on what is already known. That's not to say that you should ignore what is known. Of course you shouldn't. You should learn from it. But you need to learn in a, in a flexible way, in, a, in an organic way. The situation which you're facing right now, the defilements which are causing suffering in your mind right now, the problems which you're facing right now are not the same as problems that you faced before. They're not the same as the problems which are faced by the person who wrote the Dhamma book that you're reading or who gave the Dhamma talk that you're listening to. Okay? They may be similar, of course. We hope that they're similar. We hope that you can learn from them. But you can't just dogmatically take those things and apply them in a thoughtless or unreflective way. And so what there has to be is a creative act which engages with the particular problem that you have and responds to that in an appropriate way. And so that's where the role of constraint comes because the, um, uh, the Dhamma gives us a framework within which to see those things. Yeah? And that framework doesn't determine uh, what those uh, problems are or how to, solu how, how, how to find a solution. But it, it, um, it points us in a certain direction. It gives us an orientation within which we can uh, investigate and inquire. So, for example, uh, we talk about the, the various defilements in Buddhism and there's various kinds of lists of uh, unwholesome mental qualities or unskillful mental qualities. The, the Pali word is akusala, which literally, quite literally means unskillful. It's the same word that you use if, if say, a, a carpenter is no good, then you say they're akusala. So it means unskillful. And... Uh, unskillful mental qualities that uh, are said to be those that lead towards harm and suffering. Yeah? So, and there's various kinds of lists of these and uh, they detailed lists and short ones and so on. Um, of course, one of the most common ones is uh, greed, hatred and delusion. And uh, so greed is like the attractive force that's drawing, drawing you towards things. Hatred is the repulsive force that's pushing you away. And delusion is like the fog of the mind that doesn't care and doesn't want to know. Yeah? So these, these things which are uh, twisting and pulling the mind out of shape and which are cramping the potential and the capacity of the mind. So that gives us an orientation, right? But it doesn't tell us what is this, right? What, act, what is this? What's actually happening in me right now? Right? Is that greed? Is it hatred, delusion? Is it not, none of those things? I don't know. I have to look. And it's not obvious. Yes, yes, sometimes we can do it. Sometimes, you know, well, yeah, I'm angry. <laughs> my heart's pounding. I'm fuming. I'm screaming at the top of my voice. Yes, I think it's fairly reasonable to assume I'm angry. That's, that's fairly straightforward. But a lot of the time, it's not straightforward, yeah? And so we have to be to uh, uh, investigate and reflect and constantly being inquiring. 
Now, if we do have those things, right, if we do have greed or hatred or delusion, what do we do about it, right? And also the Dhamma, again, gives us an orientation, it gives us a, a helping hand, it gives us a guideline, but it doesn't tell us what do we do. Yeah? Sometimes you don't have to do very much. Sometimes it's enough just to realize that, uh, thank you, thank you, that uh, uh, that's what it is. Greed's in my mind, you realize it, and it disappears. And so, uh, you know, you get all of these wonderful stories in the in the Pali Canon where Mara comes to tempt the Buddha or or or, or some of the the monks or nuns or something like that. And there's a whole series, for example, there's a whole series of discourses in the Bhikkhuni Sangyutta, where the Bhikkhunis are, are going off to meditate by themselves in the forest, and. Uh, and Mara comes to tempt them. So sometimes he's the seductor, the seducer. He comes and, and uh, tries to tempt the nuns, or sometimes he um, tries to scare them or debate with them or various kinds of things. Uh, one of them, he comes, and this very famous one, he says, you know, why are you even bothering to try? You're just a woman, right? A woman can't realize the truth. You know, she's only got the, she's only got the he uses the phrase, two-fingered wisdom, right? So, you know, if you're wise, they say that you grasp something. Yeah? So I grasp something because I'm, 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 I'm a man, right? So I can grasp it firmly, but a woman can only, she's only got two-fingered wisdom and she can't really hold it properly. Yeah? So this is, this is what Mara says. Okay? Mara says, you, with your two-fingered wisdom, how can you hope to understand the truth which is so subtle and which even the great sages find only with difficulty? And, uh, and the bhikkhuni name now, which one was it? Okay, well, the Bhikkhuni answers, um, when the mind is concentrated in samadhi, yeah, when you're seeing dhammas, seeing the, the, the rising of phenomena with, with vipassana, with clear insight, then who cares whether you're a man or a woman? Yeah? And anybody who's thinking, I'm a man or I'm a woman, then Mara can go off and talk to them. Yeah? So there's a very beautiful uh, response there. And when that happens, then Mara vanishes, yeah? disappears, sad and disappointed. Yeah? Poor old Mara, just disappeared where he, where he is. Or there's another case where he comes up and threatens Upalawarna, the great uh, Bhikkhuni disciple, and uh, says to her, um, uh, aren't you afraid, you know, a, a lone woman like yourself here in the forest? Anybody could come, you know, there could be rogues or bandits, anything could come like that. Don't you feel, don't you feel scared? And Upalawana said, he made a kind of great reply, I can't remember it exactly, but uh, said something like, Mara, he, he, Mara, she said, even if a thousand rogues like you came along, that wouldn't make me stir, stir a single hair on my head. I could just disappear in front of you like that. Or I could, I could, I could make myself so small and walk up and down between your eyebrows and you wouldn't even know that I'm there. And uh, so she's, she's uh, making some rather strong, strong claims there. So, and again, Mara, sad and disappointed, disappears right there. The great images of poor old Mara. He it's, 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 it uses these phrases like his shoulders drooping, his, his lute, he carries it. Mara's a guitar player, right? So his, his guitar sort of falls off, his shoulders drooping, scratching the ground with a stick. Depressed, sad, and depressed. <laughs> so sometimes that's all you need to do. You need to say, "Mara, I know you. Yeah, I know you, Mara." And then he disappears. And uh, we've been talking um, th that this is a motif which is also found in in Western stories. That uh, sometimes they're just recognizing the devil and is enough to make him disappear. And uh, we've been talking recently about Western philosophy and Wittgenstein and things like that. But actually, it was a, a remark quoted of Wittgenstein that when, when one of these stories was told to him, uh, his, his comment was, ah, profound, profound. Yeah? So I think that is a very profound truth. Sometimes Mara, you just recognize him, and he goes. Quite a lot of the time, actually, which is a bit of a relief. Sometimes he doesn't, right? Sometimes... He stays there. Sometimes just recognizing him isn't enough. 
And so you need to do something about it. Uh, and again, there's a variety of different uh, approaches and things to be done. Sometimes you apply the kind of the method, the straight, most, the most basic method is the method of opposites, right? So you have a particular kind of quality, so you develop the other quality. So if you have anger, then you develop love and kindness, okay, to, to overcome that. Okay? If you've got uh, uh, greed for something, then you reflect on the disadvantages of that thing, right? So if you can't stop thinking about getting a new plasma TV or something like that, then you've got to start thinking to yourself, well, how much is this going to cost? Uh, what about the environmental impact of it? You know, are the kids going to spend all day watching TV and blah, 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 and all of these kinds of things? So you reflect on the disadvantages of something, and then that can make the, the greed go away. So uh, that's, 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 that's what that does, what that technique does is that that um, helps to bring the mind back into a balance and to um, to shift and um, shift 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 out the the forces that are that are bringing disturbance to the mind so that they're they're kind of um, put aside. So just by doing that, you're not necessarily going to solve any problems in, the, in a long-term way. Yeah, you know, it's it's not it's not it's not meant to do that. It's just meant to bring the mind into a sense of balance so that you've got more coherence about the mind and more stability. And um, so, so in in, in developing that, that practice and trying to lead to stability in mind, your, your first practice is simply to just know it. So we just do that through mindfulness. You bring awareness to it. I know you, Mara, and then Mara goes away, and that's good. Okay. If that doesn't work, then you can try this method of opposites. Yeah. And partly that depends on how much um, is happening and what kind of problem is 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 influencing or is attacking is is disturbing the mind. If the problem is uh, not any particular emotional or intellectual or whatever um, issue, but is simply the, the disturbance of the mind and the, just the kind of the ordinary random stuff that's going on, then just knowing it is the best response. Okay? You don't have to do anything more than that, just to know it and to give it time. Okay? And within that, the, 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 the crucial thing that makes that work is the... Um, the relishing of peace and the 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 the, um, the the love of peace and if you really 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 love peace and quiet and the stillness of the heart then you won't go out searching for those other things. And there'll be like an inclination of the mind that will incline inwards, incline towards stillness, incline towards wholeness, and will be disinclined towards fragmentation, be disinclined towards uh, indulgence. So leaving aside those things as much as possible, you're just coming back inside. But if, if there's a particular force in the mind which is hurting you or bringing, a, bringing something up, then you need to use the method of opposites. Now, sometimes that doesn't work either, okay? And then you need to look again. Well, if that's not working, why isn't that working? One reason why that's not working sometimes is because there's some external condition which you need to change, okay? And so you, you haven't actually been putting the attention in the right place. So, for example, you might have a problem, a, a relationship problem. Yeah, you, you, you're not getting on with somebody, and then that's causing a problem in yourself. And then you say to yourself, "Oh, I should let go of my anger towards that person." And you sit and you try to meditate, and you try it and try it and try it, and it just doesn't work. Right? And you keep on getting annoyed with them and all of these things, and it just doesn't work. And the problem is that that's not the way to overcome that problem. 
But what you need to overcome that problem by speaking to that person. So the way to overcome you know, problems of relationship is through speech, not through meditation. So, so if it's not working, so then, so that's why you have to have to experiment again, and, and this is again why you have to be be that 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 that, um, that um, thing of creativity, because it's never exactly the same. Yeah, sometimes it is just a matter of reflecting to yourself and saying, "Oh, well, that was a bit stupid," and then just getting over it. But then sometimes it's not, and then sometimes you need to sit down and talk with that person, or do something. Uh, sometimes you can't talk with the person, right? And so that's also so that's another level. Sometimes you have to realize, well, that person actually is completely impossible, and there's not po no point in me wasting my time by talking with them, right? And uh, and that's just true. There are some people whose whose personalities and characters are so uh, fractured and disturbed that there's not much you can do for them. And unless you're prepared to invest a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of uh, emotional um, uh, support for them, then there's not much you can do. And so at least you can you can only all you can do is look after yourself. So uh, again, that's something you have to again have to be creative with, and you have to you have to be prepared to experiment and try it in different ways at different times. And 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 when you when you realize that you realize that that actually our experience, the world that we live in from moment to moment, is constantly being created by through conditions, and those conditions are both external and internal. Yeah? So again, this comes back to that that notion of creation, which uh, uh, we started with, and of course the. the the, what the Buddha was getting at was the point that um, there's not like one, one first original moment which uh, was an act of creation and, and that like the, the story of the world is, is an unfolding of that one particular act. Okay? That's not how the Buddha looked at things at all. The way the Buddha looked at things it was as, an, as a process of continual creation. So this is what we call dependent origination. The world is constantly being created and recreated, shaped and reshaped every moment. And the forces that brought the world into being, the forces that created the universe, are just as alive now in us as they were at any other time. It just means that, that conditions are rolling on and we're, we're, we're part of those conditions. We, we don't... We don't just create everything from a blank slate. We, we, we influence, we work with, we work in those conditions. Yeah? We help to shape those conditions, that's all. So, uh, if in trying to um, deal with the mind, Trying to deal with the mind, you know, the, the problems that we encounter. Again, I mentioned certain levels of problems. Some of them just the ordinary stuff of the mind, ordinary movement, and so on. With those, we just let them go and just come back to our meditation. Or if they're a bit stronger, more disturbing, then we use the method of opposites. If that doesn't work, then sometimes we can change our external environment, uh, and that's helpful. Sometimes even that's not enough. And maybe we need to do some other things. So maybe if we've got some particular kind of psychological problem or emotional problem, then we need some counseling. We need to actually talk to somebody who can help us with that. And so this is why uh, in Buddhism, you have this notion of what they call the Kalyanamitta, of course, the good friend. And uh, a very famous sutta where, where, where Ananda comes to the Buddha and says, uh, Bhante, good friendship is, is half of the holy life. Half of spiritual life is good friendship. And uh, the Buddha says, say not so, Ananda, say not so. Good friendship is the whole of the holy life. So the, in so far as we have a community of Buddhists, a community of meditators, a community of like-minded people who are, uh, have the Dhamma as the guide for their life, you know, that's the reason why we come together and we help each other. You know, I these days, if we want to learn about Dhamma, we don't have to 
see anybody. And I think there's a lot of people who do that. They just seem there's a lot of people who seem to just sit at home and just read Dhamma on the internet and and argue with each other on Dhamma chat groups, you know, <laughs> and have these these uh, <laughs> aggressive exchanges about the nature of jhanas or enlightenment or something like that. And uh, quite extraordinary, really. <laughs> and um, and of course, you know, that to get that information is one thing. You know, they, that that's, has a certain usefulness. But there's something else, which is a community. Yeah, and the the things which you learn from a community, and the things which um, we can give to a community, the way we can serve, uh, are quite different. They operate in a different, there's a different aspect of the mind. So there are some things which we can only learn sometimes from others and the, the advice of others. And the Buddha said that uh, in attaining stream entry or to realize the, the first vision of the truth, he said there are two crucial qualities and uh, they are uh, Yoniso Manapikara and Parato Ghosa. Yoniso Manapikara being um, a sincere uh, inner reflection and investigation, inquiry, and the Parato Ghosa being the voice of another. So those two things. Very important to remember that. The, 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 the inner, in, inner work that has to happen and the, the, uh, the help from, from the voice of another, according to Buddhist tradition. <coughs> um, for everyone, except for very rare beings, we call Pacheka Buddhas, but for everyone apart from that, <coughs> um, the realization of enlightenment or the being, ability to see the truth is at least partially dependent on what we can actually learn, okay? on, our edu on our education, our spiritual education. And those words of the truth, those words of the Dhamma are an essential ingredient that lead to our awakening. And so one of the things that that means is that we should be always have this keen interest in and um, uh, acknowledgement of the importance of listening to the Dhamma and reading the Dhamma and discussing the Dharma with our friends. And that external side is always reminding us, even if it's just telling us something we already know, it's reminding us of it. And we often, of course we know that, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the thing, we don't know something just by hearing it once. We have to be told again and again and again and again, usually. I mean, I'm just speaking for myself here, right? But again and again and again, and finally it sinks in. Oh, okay, that's what they were getting at, and you see it. So that's really crucial. And then when that has, um, when so we, so we should we should we should really value every opportunity that we have to discuss the Dhamma, to listen to the Dhamma, to read the Dhamma, and we should try to do that every day, make that a regular part of our life. But that's not enough. We also have to have the Yonisho Manasikara, which is the, the sincere internal application of those teachings to our own experience. And so that's where that aspect of creativity comes in. We have to know what is, how do I apply this to what's actually happening now? And uh, I know we've been discussing this a bit with, with Jason before, so I've got some idea what he's, he's talking about, but also that um, it does also relate to question of uh, creativity in a more normal sense of artistic work, and so it's been a, we've been talking a bit about Buddhism and and the arts and so on. And of course, uh, you know, if you've been to the art gallery recently, they've got another stunning exhibition of Buddha images there. So you can see that that um, Buddhist belief has in fact been a huge stimulus to creative and artistic activity for many many hundreds of years, thousands of years. And one of the reasons for that is because artistic activity or the artistic endeavor is essentially the creation of wholeness. Okay? When you, when you uh, create a work of art, whether it be making a painting or a poem or a song or something like that, you have certain boundaries which define uh, what that work is and certain rules which govern how uh, that takes shape. And so what you want to do is create that wholeness 
but the trick to it is that you create a wholeness which has enough complexity and ambiguity and contradiction and so on to be realistic and to be meaningful. Yeah? So it has to actually reflect the real world but still be contained within that wholeness. And that's, that's the trick of, of, of creation and creating things. But that's also very much like the work that we have to do in our own mind, like how we actually develop ourselves spiritually. We have to create ourselves in a way that's whole. Uh, and psychologists use the word integrated. So that means that there's a sense of unity, there's a sense of oneness to it. You're not constantly fighting with yourself. We know what that feels like, don't we? A feeling that you're pulled in different ways at the same time. Yeah, That um, you really want to do that, but actually you know you should do this. And the feelings of confusion about your own desires or your own needs and so on. And so that's all that lack of wholeness. And when that, when that wholeness is there, those things drop away. And there's this feeling of contentment and oneness and unity. And that contentment and oneness and unity is exactly what we're developing when we develop the meditation, we develop the metta meditation, the mind inside the body, everything integrated, the feeling is there, the perception, the awareness, the sense of peace, the joy, all of those things are there and the mind's content to stay within that. And so that's what we regard as a state of, uh, like, like um, a state of health in Buddhism. Okay? It's not a state of enlightenment, that's not like the realization of the ultimate truth. It's merely uh, a, a good place to be. It's a good, healthy state of the mind. And so it's a good platform for further development. So uh, the more we can go further inwards in our meditation and um, realize what that feels like, experience what that feeling of oneness and wholeness is, the more we will value that and the more we will realize that um, getting, getting too much involved with external things is just not what the meaning of our life is about. That there's, a cer there's certain things we need to do in the external things. There's certain things that are beneficial to do. So we don't stop external involvement Completely, that's part of us as well. But we do we work in a way that's constructive and that's helpful. And when those things come that are damaging and destructive, as they inevitably will, then we have a place of refuge. Yeah? And maybe we say, well, actually, that's like really hurtful. What's happened is like really hurtful and really painful. But actually, I know that there's somewhere where that hurt and that pain doesn't penetrate. So then you have a faith that no matter how hard that is, no matter how painful, there is a place of safety.